This week in the Enterprise News, how Anchor rolls out an open source to DevOps tools, Rapid7 Cloud Identity and Access Management Governance Module for Divi Cloud, Digital Shadows launches Access Key Alerts, Microsoft Azure customers can now implement Datadog as a monitoring solution for their cloud workloads, and Ping Identity unveils Ping One services. In our second segment, we welcome Chris Necker, the CISO of Spring Labs, to discuss trading least privilege for security theater. In our final segment, we welcome Jen Ayers, VP of Overwatch at CrowdStrike, for an interview on the 2020 Threat Hunting Report insights from the CrowdStrike Overwatch team. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Today, every business is a digital business. Most of us are migrating workloads to the cloud, adopting DevOps tools, rolling out RPA software, and supporting a remote workforce. While opportunity is great, so is the risk of advanced cyber attacks. Many high-profile breaches start with a compromise of privileged credentials. CyberArk is the number one leader in privileged access management. Talk to CyberArk today to secure privileged access for humans and machines across hybrid and cloud environments and on endpoints. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash CyberArk and stay one step ahead of the attackers. Cyber criminals are opportunistically targeting industries that continue to operate full tilt during the coronavirus shutdowns, and their attacks have grown more sophisticated. Given this shifting landscape, taking the appropriate countermeasures becomes paramount. Mimecast Email Security 3.0 helps you evolve from a perimeter-based security strategy to one that is comprehensive and pervasive with cyber resiliency in mind. From the company that stops at nothing to block cyber threats, Mimecast is offering a fully featured 90-day web security service. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Mimecast to learn more. Detecting and responding to threats in the cloud is harder than doing it on-prem. Even when you do have the visibility you need, legacy security workflows weren't designed for the speed and complexity of cloud environments. Cloud-native security solutions from ExtraHop are purpose-built to spot threats across the hybrid attack surface, provide detailed investigation steps, and help you automate response. Request your 30-day free trial at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. Welcome to episode 201 of Enterprise Security Weekly for October 7th, 2020. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, joined by Mr. Matt Alderman, remotely. Matt, welcome. Happy Wednesday. We start a Q4, Paul. I mean, what? we got a lot right. of news to cover this week. Yeah. A lot of news. Uh, I mean, we did miss last week, but a lot of the news I pulled was was this week, not last week. Uh, so we might have missed some in there, uh, which is unfortunate, but we do our best. Um, A quick announcement. Would you like to have all of your favorite Security Weekly content at your fingertips? Do you want to hear from Sam and Andrew when we have upcoming webcasts and technical trainings? Have a question for one of our illustrious hosts, someone from the Security Weekly team, or just wish you could hang out with the Security Weekly crew and community? Subscribe on your favorite podcast catcher, sign up for our mailing list, and join our Discord server to stay in the loop with all things Security Weekly by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. If you have a specific guest or topic you'd like us to cover on one of the shows, you can submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guests, complete the form, and we'll review them at some point. Maybe soon, maybe later. It it, it definitely varies. On to, yeah, it depends on how many meetings we have right? on Friday. <laughs> on to the news uh, for this week. There's a glare coming from the top of my laptop, huh? Uh, lots of news to cover this week, uh, w- which is which is fun. Where did you want to start, Matt? I, well, there's a group of acquisitions and yeah. funding announcements that I thought you know we could kind of cover off quickly. And name and changes, name changes that. too, which is Microsoft yeah. renames Bing to Microsoft Bing because Microsoft's just on a tangent of like renaming everything, which I, it, it's actually a really good order. I didn't put it in here. Um, but go check it out on the Microsoft blog. Um, uh, and there was an article where someone wrote about it, basically talking about name changes. So I thought it was timely. GFI is becoming I in Inet Inetum Inet I Inetum 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 Inetum. Yeah, that's that's a pretty terrible name. Sorry, GFI or Inetum folks. Now uh, I don't think it's great. I, name changes and branding are a whole thing in and of itself. We were just talking about play bigger at the top of uh, this show before we went live. So. 
Um, I'm not sure what's behind uh, the name change. Uh, GFI was playing in the kind of small business last I checked in vulnerability management. I haven't heard from them uh, in some time. So, Yeah, it was the GFI group. It had a bunch of sub products mm -hmm. in it. They changed their name. Why? I'm not quite sure. I mean, I get it when you like we're going through the fun of an acquisition but, and yeah. getting integrated into a larger portfolio. So brand. Right. Discussions are, are very interesting in right. that kind of environment. I mean, that's more like Facebook and uh, Instagram and WhatsApp, right? They've done tried to do kind of similar things with their brands, right? Yeah. It gets tough mm -hmm. uh, sometimes. But just changing a name for no reason, yeah. I also think is really, really tough because you you just threw away this history of, of yeah. brand recognition. Right. Good or bad. But, I mean, to change it, it gets really difficult. Right. Uh, there yeah. were some acquisition funding announcements as well yeah uh, so i added a couple uh articles in here tanium is hmm. in the news again with another funding round i mean we just covered them what in june i think yeah. a few months ago they took a big round they just took another 150 million dollars in funding i wow. think they're over 900 million dollars in funding think about that for a second when some of these companies go into the public market their their valuations are you know a billion and a half two billion mm -hmm. These guys have taken nine hundred million dollars in funding, right? And that's, they have and that's basically yet. debt. That's debt, right? At the end yeah. of the day, essentially, in some form or fashion. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you're giving up equity, you're giving up stake right. in order for that money to continue to come in. There are high expectations for an exit for Tanium at right. some point. Um, CrowdStrike is kind of the the closest Just, comparison yep, yep. that that people are going to compare them to. Um, you know, we're talking a multi-billion dollar IPO if these guys ever go IPO. Which they should. I mean, that's their logical next step, right? Correct. They're not going to yeah. take much more money. I mean, it'd be difficult for them, I think, to take much more money I, I at this point. They, uh, you know, they took, what, $200 million in early Earlier. 2019. Yep. We thought that was that was the last round they would take. They've taken Apparently two not. rounds since then, Paul. Right? So, mm. yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, this first one that I put in, mm. Cybertar launches all-in-one cybersecurity as a service to disrupt the industry with $3 million in seed round. Okay, so... That's a let, big let's seed put, round. Let, it is, but let's put this in perspective. They want to go after the entire cybersecurity market. Mm -hmm. They want to build a SaaS platform, that and they everything. have $3 million in, in funding. Do you know I what mean, this thing's going to cost to build? It's a good start, but probably doesn't That's get a lot. It's a lot. A lot of money, a lot of investment will have to go into this company to yeah. meet this expectation. It's a lot of R and D. It's, it's a, lot a lot of R and D people that not only are expensive but hard to find. And to entice talent, you're gonna have to pay them even more. I mean, it, it's no secret that in any business, your one of your biggest expenses, if not the biz, biggest expense, are employee salaries and, and benefits. Yep. Yeah. It, it, people eat up cash mm -hmm. fast. I've modeled these businesses before mm -hmm. with a number of startups. $3 million does not go far when you have to hire a bunch of engineering talent, right. let yeah, alone, true. let alone your AWS bill or wherever yeah. you're going to, wherever you're going right. to run this SaaS based platform. So yep. I love the enthusiasm, but I'm just saying this company will have to raise a lot more money to be successful on this, uh, right. on this kind of announcement. Um, Paul Padgett, a good friend of the, ours and a good friend of the show, uh, is working for Norm Shield and helped them, I would imagine, uh, as I believe their CEO, uh, secure $7.5 million in Series A funding. That's a good Series A round. Yes. Three million in a seat is a lot. Seven point five in a Series A, and you, you got a good idea, you got some customers, and you're running with it, right? Yeah, I mean, this is a, it's like right in the range, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think of A rounds kind of in that six to ten million. You kind of right. you're fitting right in that range, yeah, right? They, got a, they say they have 145 customers across financial, healthcare, retail, and technology. Um, what what exactly do they do? Well, so that's what I was trying to figure out. Yeah. Cyber risk ratings with open standards, financial risk quantification, and scalability. Mm -hmm. So what I think they're doing is some level of uh, external or digital risk. They're trying to quantify that kind of as a value at risk play. We've seen a lot of these vendors in the past not succeed. Yeah. Uh, I think value at risk uh, vendors have had some struggles in the past, really proving value. How do you put a, how do you quantify 
a financial impact or value on assets. Uh, it looks like they are doing something similar. Maybe they've actually figured out a way to make it scale and, and work well where this company could survive. I think we'll have to do a little more deep dive with Paul at some point about what they're doing, kind yeah. of what the secret sauce. But 145 customers is a good that's, starting point, yeah, that's right? really good, yeah. yeah. Uh, what else we got in there? Tons of stuff. Uh, yeah. So Ten of Tenable's got... in there. Yeah, but they're not funding announcement. They're, no, uh, I'm sorry. So oh, there was more let's... funding announcements. Yeah, and acquisitions, right? Mm. So Zero Fox bought Cyvalence. Now, this is an interesting mm. acquisition because Cyvalence was part of Looking Glass. It was an acquisition Looking Glass did back in, I think, 2015 or 2016. And, oh, no, actually, yeah, the purchase of Cyvalence, oh, yeah, it's first acquisition for Zero Fox. But what's interesting is, so this was part of Cyvalence. They buy this, which is a threat intelligence feed, to integrate into Zero Fox's platform. Mm -hmm. Makes a ton of sense. Mm -hmm. But then when you talk about the company, it's like, so does Looking Glass survive this? Because they don't talk about Looking Glass after the fact, right? They say so this existing was surveillance, surveillance customers yeah. will continue to receive their services as normal and will also be offered access to Zero Fox's solutions. Interesting. But does the rest of Looking Glass remain? Was this just a, like a subset asset purchase? So I'm, I'm confused on mm. what the future of Looking Glass looks like, but hmm. it was interesting. Makes sense for Zero Fox. Yep. Uh, Eclipsium, good friends yes. of ours, uh, raises $13 million to scale the company, expand sales, delivery, and R&D. Good for uh, them. Yeah. We, lo we love them. I mean, they're a sponsor. We love Eclipsium. They're just... We courted them for quite some time, by the way. <laughs> Inside baseball, like we loved the team and their technology for a really long time, uh, and so happy that you know we, we get to work together now, and very happy they just received a funding round, very well deserved, very timely. Actually, on Paul Security Weekly, we're going to talk about some uh, Kaspersky. Actually, found some rant, uh, not ransomware, but malware. I haven't dug into it fully. Uh, that uh, infects the systems and reinfects them via some flaws in UEFI. Yeah, this great firmware play. We've had yeah. them on multiple shows. Yeah, John Lucades uh, and company. Great, yeah. yeah, great, great technology. Um, and then Ping Identity also announced an acquisition of Showcard. Right. Uh, and this is interesting. Showcard is they. Uh, it, it's about a personal identity vault on your phone. Mm. So it's the ability to store your identities in a vaulting technology on your mobile device, which allows you to gain access into various systems. Uh, so integrates into the rest of the ping identity and access management suite, kind of an interesting acquisition. It, it moves some of their capabilities. It looks like down into, into mobile a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was an interesting acquisition that was announced as well. And they, ping also had a product announcement. They did ping one services, a suite of standalone cloud services that provide advanced identity and access management capabilities. Uh, is, is this like a managed service? It sounds like, or I'm not sure. Uh, well, it, yeah, kind of. So it says ping one MFA is a multi-factor authentication cloud service that provides, mm -hmm. uh, that protects account takeover attacks, compromise, compromised credentials. So it, it's rolling more of their capabilities together. It looks delivering mm -hmm. it as a cloud service. So identity as a service kind of offerings, uh, adds, uh, multi-factor authentication and then some other um, administration capabilities in this um, single um, platform. Sweet. Now yeah. you can get to Tenable and some of the other stuff because yeah. there's all kinds of other stories in here. Uh, <laughs> Tenable announces capability to continuously see and secure cloud compute instances, which I thought was interesting, without the yeah, need it, for additional software. Well, yes and no. Mm. You, if you do the research like I do, then you realize what you actually need. So this is saying, hey, you don't need to schedule a scan. You don't need an agent. You just use AWS's system manager run command. By the way, that requires an agent. Mm -hmm. So you need an agent. You don't need Tenable's agent. Gotcha. But you need Amazon's agent in this particular case to make this work. Uh, what I assume this is doing is it allows you to grab some information off the box that they can then evaluate offline to identify any misconfigurations or vulnerabilities. This is going to be very limited to AWS in this configuration. The question is, how would this get supported in Azure and Google mm -hmm. Cloud? Um, it, it, look, it's an okay feature. I, I get 
what they're trying to do here is leverage some of the native cloud capabilities to provide vulnerability information, maybe some misconfiguration information. I think there's some more, I think there's better innovation out there that's doing this a little better um, than this right now. So it, it, they talk about this groundbreaking capability. Eh, maybe um, it, it is extending what they can do in the cloud. I'm just not quite sure how they'll also create comparable capabilities, like I said, in Azure and GCP and the other cloud providers. So we'll see. Uh, Digital Shadows launches the access key alerts. So they'll tell you when your access key has been exposed a- after it's been exposed. I think, Matt, you and I have seen technologies that I think do a really good job of preventing this from happening, which is where I think your initial investment needs to be. This is a nice feature, but also don't forget it's after the fact. Right. right. And, and I mean, and, natively in some platforms, you know, GitHub's telling you this kind of stuff, for example, hmm? um, and, you know, secure circles helping you protect those, um, uh, bef- you know, while they're in development, right? Protecting it in the uh, developer environment. Uh, as well as anytime it hits a file system, right? Um, and then you've got a Curix, which I think does a really good job of checking your configuration where you could find these before it goes out to production, uh, yep. potentially. I think there's there's just a, a, a list, I think, of companies that we're uh, pretty well invested in and really like that help you before it gets to the point where it's actually public, right? Right. I mean, this is a great alerting capability, mm-hmm for you to go do incident response and forensics, but wouldn't it be better if I could prevent this stuff in the yeah. first place? Yeah. <laughs> it's the same. It was, uh, uh, Clayton recommended a, a company that we were talking to as well that I think would also play into protecting yeah. your data, right, in the cloud. Yeah, yeah. Gamma Networks, I yeah. think, is that other one that we're looking at right now. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I would... Stuff. Again, I'd put my investment into protecting it before it went out. And that laundry list of vendors, Matt, and I just went through are ones that we really like that can help more on the protection front. Not to say you shouldn't have something like a digital shadows looking over it, but don't, I mean, again, that's after the fact. Don't rely on it for protection, right? It's detection, which is still important. Right. Uh, Microsoft Azure customers can now implement Datadog as a monitoring service for their uh, cloud workloads. The, I think good this is, has a lot to do with Ignite. Yep, mm-hmm. um, and in doing that, uh, this Rapid Seven uh, article is actually really interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Um, this is Identity and Access Management Governance module for Divi Cloud. You know, they bought Divi Cloud uh, a few months back. Gives them some more c- cloud play. Now, you want to talk about monitoring cloud environments, mm-hmm. right? This is a much better way to think about it holistically is what Rapid Seven's done and is acquired somebody like Divi Cloud. Now, really works on the runtime side, which is fine, where Acurix kind of looks at your infrastructure's code mm-hmm. before you deploy and then also does some monitoring in real time. Divi Cloud's more on the real time monitoring side. This is much better insight into your cloud assets than this uh, AWS as, uh, systems management run command thing. It, right at the end of the day plus divi cloud supports multiple cloud environments right. now they're adding identity and access management governance in here again identity is a big part of cloud and, and making sure those um those credentials are are being protected and secured i like where rapid seven is going with this acquisition i think it expands the portfolio even more than what they've already done a fantastic job doing this is some exciting stuff mm. Yeah, agreed. I like this solution a lot better than some of the other ones we've talked about. Yep. Um, Anchor's rolling out an open source uh, DevOps tool. I haven't checked it out. Two of them, yet. actually. It's, it's actually two. pretty yep. cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love this one. So uh, the first one is called Sift, S Y F T. Uh, and this helps you build your software bill of materials. So this is going through, uh, you, uh, I think, your code or your libraries and identifying all the components made up in the project. Look, we know that the supply chain on the code side is important. Uh, The ability to build out your software bill of materials, I think is really interesting. So this one's called SIFT, and they talk about it as SIFT through your projects. Kind Mm -hmm. of a cute name. Right. The second one is called Gripe, and this one is called Gripe about dangerous stuff. And so this is a vulnerability scanner that goes through and identifies vulnerabilities in those different packages. So again, we've seen a lot of solutions 
in the vulnerability space, right? Software composition analysis tools and other tools that go through, look for known vulnerabilities. As an open source tool, there's typically some limitations. It's gonna find mm -hmm. the known stuff, but then you've got a lot of commercial tools that do a lot of additional things on top of that. You know, sneak, right. yeah. synopsis, the there's a lot of tools out right. there, yeah, that do a really good job. It's a great open source project, don't get me wrong, and helps people kind of like table stakes, known vulnerabilities. I'm just not sure it's going to provide as much value as some of the commercial tools that, that we've talked about in the past. And it looks like they've made it a lot easier because Anchor had some open source stuff uh, as well. And there's a few open source things that do this, but it looks like they made it really easy. I mean, I've got command line examples that I'm watching scroll through my screen and, and making it really easy, uh, which is nice. Yeah, the link in the article has an it's error broken. in it. Yeah, it's yeah, tool, yeah. so you, toolbox. toolbox.anchor. Dot io a n c h o r e yeah. toolbox dot anchor dot io yeah that'll get you to the page yeah so I thought that was interesting uh, attack IQ helps teams uh, find gaps uh, new critical start what was the critical start I started reading this one yeah I oh critical it, start is uh, a leading uh, provider of managed detection and response services. Uh, and then announced an offering with Attack IQ to help customers create a new line of defense against malicious online actors. So, yeah, Attack IQ is going down the kind of uh, MSP or MDR services uh, route, which I think, you know, for smaller security teams in smaller enterprises probably makes a whole lot of sense. Yes. I, I mean, we, we love the breach and attack simulation mm -hmm. space, but we also know, you know, Certain organizations don't have the resources mm. to manage this stuff. So, you know, I can see a, a set of managed services around these capabilities to really help organizations understand where their weaknesses are to get them addressed. Doing that as a managed service at the small to medium enterprise makes a lot of sense because right. it, it's tough for them to have the resources to do it themselves. I, I mean, do you see Baz as a feature or is it, I keep waiting for it to like blow up, right? In it, in a good way. Um, and it, I feel like it's still kind of on that slow growth kind of pattern and it's hovering on like feature. Are they going to get acquired and integrated into other larger companies? Like vulnerability management would be a great place. Um, I think to, to, uh, integrate this into, right. So I keep waiting for some of the big VM vendors potentially to start dipping in and buying the uh, breach and attack simulation vendors. We haven't seen that happen, right? They're largely still standing on their own. We haven't seen acquisitions that in this space really at all no not really at all right um in in the question you ask a good question can it stand alone mm -hmm. i don't know right i i definitely see great integration points for this market and, yes. and vulnerability management's one threat and vulnerability management and prioritization is another mm -hmm. one um yep. to augment some of those capabilities you know the vm vendors are moving into that space but you have a whole separate market of threat vulnerability what they call risk-based vulnerability management now, I think is what yep. Gartner calls the space. This plays into that. You've got some other great yeah. solutions like, like Red could... Seal and Skybox yep. that are doing yes. aspects of this, right. right? That can also overlay here. Yeah. I, I, I think we're starting, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we start approaching that point, right? Where Akena um, or Red Seal starts going, yeah, we should have one of these vendors because they do tie together very nicely. Yeah, they do. Um, what else? Um, uh, storage capabilities. The lar industry's largest encrypted hardware drive. I thought that was interesting, and that's probably all we want to say about it right now. Um, Nimbus achieved success with cloud backup powered by Asigra. Um, was oh, Digital Ocean app platform helping developers easily deploy, manage, and scale apps. This kind of sounded like um, a Lambda kind of uh, competitor, right? Yeah, I didn't get into that one deep. I was looking at the the Venify uh, PKI one uh, before right. the show. So this is a, uh, a platform as a service offering automates infrastructure mm -hmm. management, so developers can code to production in just a few clicks. I think we're going to see you know folks like DigitalOcean and Heroku, some of the smaller players, uh, trying to get some feature parity in certain areas with you know the bigger AWS, GCP, and uh, Azure's of the world. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and they're leveraging Kubernetes as part of their orchestration platform. So you could see this almost like a managed Kubernetes mm -hmm. kind of platform for developers to not only build but run their applications. They're going to start to cross over into some really interesting markets with yeah. what GitLab's doing on the CICD pipeline side, mm -hmm. the cloud providers. Even Docker and Mirantis on the enterprise side of, of running their own. Right. Yeah, uh, Docker's it, the one that right? we talked about last time. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That will round out the news for today. We'll take a short break. Come back with our first interview with Chris Necker. Stay tuned.